Good afternoon and welcome to another A Push podcast with Mr. Pate. Today we're going to be talking about different forms of combinations that occur as modern industrialization takes place in the late 1800s. So we're going to go ahead and start with just a kind of a definition up here. Laissez faire means the government will be hands off, they will be uninvolved, they will allow the system to work on its own. This goes along with Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, and his theory of capitalism that essentially the system will work on its own. You will learn more about this in economics class in the future, but essentially he kind of advocated what we would call a purely competitive market where the government will not be regulatory in nature and basically things like supply and demand will naturally emerge through uh, just price and consumer demand and interest and it'll it'll naturally come about and that companies will do well or do poorly based on customer satisfaction and what consumers want and need uh, their interests. So this idea of laissez-faire was very popular. Now what we're going to see is kind of big picture right now. We're going to see that basically the laissez-faire system has some flaws, that it's going to need some government regulation. But at the time we're talking about the late 1800s, this regulation does not exist. There is no regulation. So here we go. Laissez-faire capitalism is what is in place. Consolidation. Okay, what you start to see, giving you a little bit of background. We had earlier on, we had early industrialization. You had these fledgling American companies. They're getting going mainly in textiles, later on spreading out to other fields. And they needed tariffs to protect them from the already established British manufacturers. So these tariffs were in place. Well, by the time you get to the mid-1800s, and by the time you even get to the Civil War, you really have a modern industrial nation that is you know, emerging. And consolidation becomes a trend that really takes off during the Gilded Age that we're studying, kind of post-1870, where you're going to see different companies find strategies to take over a home market. Now, we tend to, when we hear about consolidation or even this term trusts, we tend to think of a different term. We think monopoly. And a monopoly is an economic term for a kind of market that can exist. But what we're talking about is just this trend of consolidation where someone in a different field was able to consolidate it. In history and looking at this period of time in the late 1800s, we refer to the term trusts. But it's pretty much the same thing as monopolies. The trusts are different combinations that are going to be created. And this isn't like, we're going to give you a few examples over here in a minute. This is not something where you have one or two that emerge. This is something where we're talking about hundreds of trusts are going to emerge. I mean, there's a trust in the sugar industry. There's a trust in the steel industry. There's a trust in the nickel industry. Tin. It did not matter. Any resource there was, combinations emerge. Now, we'll talk later on about why they're not good. Because I just kind of introduced the idea that we're operating under this idea of laissez-faire. The government is not getting involved taking a role. So, trusts emerge and they come to destroy competition and have one or a couple of choices in each of these different industries. So the first thing we're going to look at is called the pool. The example we're using for the pool is the railroad. Okay? And the railroad is essentially... You know, you have many different railroad companies that they would build and own and operate their own lines. So this is not some big surprise that this is the way it is. You know, we have company A and their lines are the blue lines. They've built them with a government subsidy, of course, because these companies, while they're operating under this idea of laissez-faire, definitely want government handouts, and the government is willing to uh, subsidize, that is, give them money to help pay for the costs of expanding westward in railroads. So we've got the blue line, that's the biggest. We've got company B, you know, they've got a few lines. Company C has a couple of lines. Well, a pool would be companies A, B, and C get together and they decide they will just share by foot of track, or my, I guess mile of track, they would share basically uh, all their profits divided up um, on a comparison 
Line A, has, company A has more miles of track, so they would get a larger percentage. But basically, all the profits come in, and they all agree to not compete. That's the bottom line thing that we see here. These companies are agreeing to operate their lines, but no one's going to try and say, well, we need to have multiple train companies operating on multiple, uh, on different lines. Now, you might say, well, if they build it, how could other ones, how could other companies do that? If they'd sued and gone to court, th this could have happened. Um, we can go back to the Charles River Bridge, Warren Bridge decision, where one company was not allowed um, uh, to have a monopoly. And I'm spacing out another one. I think it's Gibbons v. Ogden. But you had, you've had disputes that we've talked about in class where you had a river, and it was clear that monopolies could not exist on that river. And that's all stuff that's settled Supreme Court law. But they're not going to push it, and they're not going to sue each other, so there won't be a case. Because they know that if they don't compete with each other, they don't have to lower their rates. They don't have to improve their performance. Do the things competition would say you need to do. They can just operate and say, okay, we throw all the money in a pot and then divide it up proportionally according to how much track we have. That's a pool. The next thing we have is horizontal integration. Horizontal integration is essentially, and we're going to use the example of Standard Oil with John Rockefeller, essentially what happens is you have a company that's maybe a little bit bigger, and they are going to come into an agreement to join a couple of other companies, we'll call them companies B and C, and then what they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, Rockefeller says, I will give you B and C, you guys will each have uh, a 25% interest and I'll have a 50% interest or something like that. Um, or I'll have 60 and you'll each have 20, depending on whatever the proportion would be. And you get shares of stock in my company, but then your company is absorbed and so now you have one company here. Well, the bigger you get, the less you need to make in terms of profit. If I said, you got an example of Babies R Us or um, uh, some local person who has a, a baby store uh, of some, you know, baby supplies and cribs and all this stuff. Well, who needs to make more profit? The Babies R Us with 2,000 stores in the United States, whatever it is, or the person who has Molly's Baby Supply and they have one store. Um, per product to make it work, obviously, you're going to be able to buy it cheaper at Babies R Us. Okay? So Rockefeller is going to not need to make as much profit per barrel of oil or per refinery cost or whatever because he's going to be doing so much more of it. And what he then decides to do is come in and he can afford to lose. So he will come into new markets and compete with existing people. We'll say Company D and maybe Companies E, F, and G. He'll join into their markets one at a time, and then he'll undercut them and basically sell at a price they cannot match. And so they have no choice now. He will basically drive them out of business. You don't need to look far with the oil industry to see how this works. Um, if you have somewhere like a Costco or Fred Meyer that sells fuel, and they deliberately undercut the price of their customers for a little bit, people will go and wait in lines to get that. The, the Fred Meyer locally, they have another gas station that is just across the street. It's never busy, but they charge like a nickel more per gallon consistently if you use your Fred Meyer rewards card. Well, with that happening, guess what? This company, the monster company, is going to win, and they'll slowly drive these companies down to economic ruin to where they're going bankrupt unless they sell. And that's really the goal is that these companies will be economically weakened and then they'll agree to sell at a very cheap price and now the conglomeration gets larger and larger and basically Rockefeller is going to corner the entire market for petroleum in the United States before 1900 and when he does this this is before the internal combustion engine even gets going he has this dominant uh, control through Standard Oil Company now obviously here, this is not good for consumers with a pool because they don't have competition lowering prices and um, creating better you know, transportation systems or safety or anything. Up here, obviously, if he's buying out all the competition, then you know, if he's taking losses now, he's probably going to raise the prices later. That's not good for consumers either. 
Okay, our next example is vertical integration. Vertical integration is a really smart idea. Now with this, you can see why they, they make sense. They, they, there's intelligence behind this. They're not really good for the consumer. Vertical integration, not really as harmful as these other things we're looking at in terms of what's good or bad for the market. Here's how it works. You have some regular person and they want to buy steel. They go to, I'm just making up names here, the Smith Mine. And they have to pay Smith cost plus profit. The cost of digging out the iron ore from their mine plus the profit for the Smith Mine. Then they, you know, then it goes the the steel, the iron ore that's going to become steel is going to go to the Miller Railroad. Same thing, cost plus profit. And then it's going to go to Rogers Steel Mill, and they're going to use the Bessemer process, which is going to purify, get rid of the impurities, and purify iron ore into steel. And they're going to have cost plus profit. And then eventually it goes to Jackson Steel Sales, and there's cost plus profit. So you have several steps along the way, and every time profit is involved. And when profit is involved, what does that tell you? The price is going to go up because you're paying profit here, 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 and here. It's going to make the cost higher. Andrew Carnegie says, I can do it better. I've got a better idea and it's genius. He's going to say, I've got enough money. I'm going to buy the mine. I'm going to operate the mine myself at cost. I'm not going to be paying someone else. Railroad. I'm going to be operating the railroad at cost. I will take it and mine it. I will deliver it to my steel mill, all at cost, and then my company that's selling the steel, they'll make the profit. Now Carnegie is going to make as much or frankly more profit, but be able to sell it for less because he's cutting out profit at three different stages. He can afford to sell it for more profit and not even basically come close to offering at the same price. His price will undercut them. It's very smart. It's actually good for consumers. He's not necessarily driving other people out of business. Now, some vertical or some horizontal integration will be incorporated later by Carnegie because this is so successful, his competitors can't compete with them, and then he ends up buying some of them up, and you see some later vertical integration that occurs. The, the last major uh, system for combinations and consolidation is the interlocking directorate. And the way this works is essentially you have a holding company, and a holding company could be like a bank. Our example is J.P. Morgan's bank. Uh, he was the preeminent banker of his day in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so he's got a board of directors for his bank. And what he's going to do is there will be a couple of people that will be you know, on the board for companies A, B, and C, but he's going to send a chunk of his people that will become a majority for each of these companies. So now he has a majority of company A, he'll send a group to be of company B to be a majority and a group to be of company C to be a majority. Now this isn't technically vertical or horizontal integration. He's not flat out just absorbing in these companies, but it's a tricky kind of behind the scenes way that he can make sure he has control of the board of every company so they do what he wants and it's all kind of like another combination. Now the last thing we have here is why do we need competition? Why are these things a problem? Well, if we looked in other industries today, industries where you see competition, what would happen if we had one car company? It would not be a good thing. It wouldn't work out very well. But with a bunch of different car companies, when someone comes out with different innovations, everyone follows suit and improves to match those innovations or what happens? Consumers don't buy the product, they buy the other one. I'll give you some examples. The Toyota Prius Hybrid. It's the first, not the first uh, hybrid, but it's the first really popular hybrid. Well, guess what? Other companies come out and they basically try and offer similar model hybrids. They start having more hybrids in their lineup and now everybody is having hybrids because they're selling and they're popular, things like that. Other innovations, take minivans. A minivan can have something like uh, a hydraulic rear lift, like an automatic rear lift on the hatch. It can have, a uh, Honda Odyssey was the first van, minivan, I believe, to have um, automatic power doors. You could do them with keyless entry with a button there or pull on the handle, the door opened itself, and it was totally safe. It would never slam shut. Uh, that became very popular. Every company now has some sort of power door. Anytime some innovation gets introduced in the car industry, other people are going to match it, often copying the cars as close as they can to the successful one. 
And so competition becomes something that is going to increase safety in cars. It's going to increase fuel, co uh, fuel economy in cars. It's going to increase um, the performance of cars, the looks of cars, the options available with cars. It really makes a big difference. Well, that's all the time we have for today, Sam Barlow. Stay classy.